Hey, fellow workers, welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are broadcasting from the territory of the Mitsutapi. We are also proud members of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. My name is Kim Siever, and you are tuning in to episode eight of season one of the Alberta Worker Podcast. I'm excited to welcome Des Bissonnette, an uh, activist here in Alberta, who's going to share her life story with us. Welcome, Des, to the Alberta Worker Podcast. Thank you so much for bringing me on. This is super exciting. Um, I'm tuning in from Treaty 6, from the border city of Canada, Lloydminster. I'm about a couple skips away from Alberta right now. I'm actually in Saskatchewan. Fun fact. Oh, we, we can't have you on the podcast then. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I do work in, I work in Alberta though still. All of my jobs have been Alberta. So it's a little, in my community, it's really interesting. If you live on the Saskatchewan side and work in Alberta, your life is so much cheaper than if you live in Alberta and work in Alberta. Even with no provincial sales tax in Alberta. We don't have the PST in Lloyd on the Sask side either. So they go by Alberta tax rules, oh. but we have like the Saskatchewan car, the Saskatchewan phones, which is like so cheap. Um, so yeah, we get lots of really cool perks here. Nice. Yeah. nice. Now you're giving away all your secrets. Boy, the yes. It's going to boom now. All the people wanting to move there. Cheap houses are cheap too, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Well, let's just go straight into it. How about you tell us your life story? Like where were you born, where you grew up, where you went to school, what your family mm -hmm. life was like. And then as you're telling us that, just kind of incorporate your personal labor history into that, your first job or your subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, that sort of thing. Yeah. I consider my hometown bigger Saskatchewan slash Saskatoon. So that's really where my family is from. I was born in Kindersley, where my parents were living in 1995. And then they ended up moving to Saskatoon a couple of years later, where they had my brother. And I have a friend who used to live in Kindersley. Really? Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Lives in Arizona I actually, now, but... I've never been. Um, I've always kind of just wanted to go there to see what it's like, but I've been told that it's like every other place in Saskatchewan. Um, so I could probably go get some subway because every place in Saskatchewan has a subway. And bank at the Royal Bank. <laughs> yes, exactly. Go to the credit union or something. Yeah, I was um, born in yeah. Moose Jaw and I've only driven through it. I've never really done anything in Moose Jaw. So totally get it. We lived in Saskatoon for a bit and then we ended up moving to my dad's hometown, which is bigger Saskatchewan. Really small town, super tiny community. That's really nice. My mom and my brother, when I was growing up, they were the only people who were um, visibly racialized at the time. The demographic has definitely changed in recent years, but um, my memory was it was like we were one of very few First Nations families and Métis families there. My dad's a very like super white guy. He grew up in Bigger and so he was really comfortable in the community. But my mom and my brother faced some discrimination and my dad actually ended up moving out to Lloyd to work for the same reason everybody comes to Lloyd. Oilfield has lots of money. So my mom was actually working multiple jobs and she had myself and my brother for a long time. One of the things about Métis people is we all have just this really strong work, work ethic. Work is really important to the culture of the Métis. And my mom really embodies that. She is a person who has worked her whole life. And so when we were growing up, we watched her work it was really like a single mom working two jobs, coming home to make sure, you know, we were in bed, but really she had sitters for us and stuff. And we did that for a couple of years until we ended up moving out to Lloyd to be with my dad. And that's kind of really where a lot of my formative years have been. And it's really interesting because Lloyd growing up, there is such a huge wealth gap here. And in the social structure of young people in Lloyd, it is like, really enforced, which is super strange. So I was ostracized in school for a couple of different reasons. Number one, because I was one of those weird kids who was really into like Pokemon and wore pajamas to school, which <laughs> apparently is only like a thing that Canadian weird kids do. I found that out on the internet recently and I was like, okay, I thought, that, I thought everybody did this, but I guess it's just me. Um, but you know, I was, I was a weird else. kid. Yeah, <laughs> I was a weird kid and I was Métis and we were also really low income. We were living in like an apartment and all of my friends were in big expensive houses. And um, my mom was working part-time jobs for a long time and my dad had enough to keep us in the apartment, but we didn't have the same kind of money that other people in my community had. 
that. Yeah, I and, lived uh, in government housing for a few years as well. So yeah. Totally oh it. yeah, we lived in Métis housing here in Lloyd. So one of the things that was really interesting growing up, so the whole neighborhood was actually Métis housing and people who had come and living off of the reserve. So it was urban natives. The block had a nickname. Lots of people in the community used to call it Bannock Ave. And so oh. if you were you were from Bannock Ave, people would not like you. They would discriminate against you. It didn't matter who, what you looked like. They found out that that's where you live. They knew that you're Indigenous. And it was really, um, really hard for me. I actually, I had friends who were not allowed to come over to my house because their parents had found out that I lived on Bannock Ave. Wow. Um, and I had one friend whose parents told me to my face that I wasn't allowed to come to their house. They didn't want me hanging out with their kid and all of this other stuff. And they were actually right. having karaoke nights and partying with my mom without even realizing that that was my mom, right? My huh. mom has a really funny story about it um, where she she ended up telling them <laughs> that, you know, I was her kid and they're just totally lost all the blood <laughs> in their face, freaking out about it. Um, so yeah, like we we had some different kinds of discrimination. I went to school at the comp here, which is our, our high school, public high school. I had a pretty normal high school experience. I was a brony, embarrassingly enough. <laughs> Watched my little pony, all my friends did. It was pretty great. The only thing I can think of significant in high school that was a really formative experience for me was in grade 10. There was a kid in our community who, I don't remember all the details of the story, but it, it was along the time of the Trevor Project was coming out. Um, and there was a, a person in our community who was young and who was gay and who ended up taking his life. Oh, yes. And so a friend and I wanted to start a GSA in our school. And we thought it was going to be, you know, go talk to the counselor and it'll be great. No problem at all. Well, we went to the counselor and explained what we wanted to do. And we got told no. And when we asked why, they said, because the school wanted to promote abstinence, oh, which, yeah, right. Like, first, first of all, this was in like 20, gosh, 2010, maybe 2011. Oh my goodness. So yeah, like not, not long ago. Right. Um, but they, yeah, they told us they wanted to promote abstinence. They, they didn't want to have conversations about sex in school. And it was like, we just want to, we want a place to, to gather in solidarity. Um, and so that was something that I was kind of like, Hmm, I don't like that, but you know, you don't really know how to fight it when you're 15 years old. Sure. Yeah. Um, but a little bit around that time too, I had actually, I was also working. Um, so I actually had my first ever job, um, in middle school, I was 13 or 14. I, I think it might have been 14, right? When you can start working in Alberta. Mm -hmm. I was working at McDonald's. <laughs> um, it did not last very long. Uh, not a fun job for me. It was, I loved having pocket money. I like bought a DS game for my brother and myself. And I was like, all pumped about it. I had like a $200 check. I was making $8 an hour. And I thought that was like the best in the world, but it wasn't the best job in the world. It was really difficult dealing with customers, especially when you're young, people are really unreasonably mean to you. Absolutely. Well, um, it's and food so, services and being young. So it's like, yeah. Double. And people are so weird at McDonald's. I don't know what it is, but it just brings out something feral in some people. Um, there used to be this you lady. missed my pickles. Yeah. <laughs> no, there used to be this lady. She was so wild. Um, she used to come in. She had like a, a walker that converted into a seat that she could just sit anywhere, right? right? And she would order a fish fillet, extra tartar sauce. And then she would turn her walker around when I handed her her meal and sit at the counter and just eat it while making eye contact with me. And I was like 13, 14. I didn't know what to do, right? I'm like... <laughs> okay have a nice day all the time she came in every single time I worked and I, I was always like dreading the moment when I saw her coming in I was like oh no oh my she's gonna stare at me while she eats her food every time and it's only the sandwich and she'd eat it and then she'd just leave that'd be so unnerving it was it was so scary and I I, I remember really vividly one time I just got so I was really overwhelmed she had a really busy day and it was one of the longest shifts I had ever worked and they they like let us young kids work to like 11 o'clock they had us there late um and they had me there from I think it was an early day back when we still used to get Wednesdays off early in Alberta before they changed that. So I had an early day off of school. So I got to start work at like three o'clock and I was there just about till 11. And I was so stressed out. I went and sat in the milk fridge in McDonald's and I just cried <laughs> for my whole break. I was so upset and I quit after that. Um, and I didn't get another job until grade 11 because I was like, I'm not doing this. 
I don't, I don't want to do this. I did like babysitting and stuff. And I did like volunteer work, but I would not touch having a job until I got hired at Giant Tiger in 2011, yes. which was an experience. Our Giant Tiger is right beside a bar. I was a 16 year old girl working right next to a bar and I sold cigarettes. That was my, like the main part of my job because right up at the front, there was just cartons and cartons of cigarettes. So my job was to sell that, sell items, but mostly restocking the cigarettes at 16, which looking back now, I'm like, gross. How did I, like, how did anyone let me do that? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, I, it is. It's totally legal. I couldn't buy them, but I can sell them. Um, and it was, wow. Yeah, it was interesting. And we used to get lots of people coming in from the bar. You know, I get hit on a lot. I used to get lots of phone numbers, oh my um, which was super interesting. There was one bouncer, though, who would come in and buy cigarettes. And if he saw anybody hitting on me, he would lose it on them. And like, nice. it's like, this is a child that you're hitting on right now. You know that, right? Like, you can see she's a baby. Don't talk to her. <laughs> And I loved that guy so much. He was my favorite. Um, He's that a big job guy? actually, yeah, he was. And um, they actually, at one point, that bar had a, a teens' night once, which is also super weird. It was like it was dry. There was no alcohol, but they let teenagers come in. And he, he was there and came and talked to me. And we were we were chatting. And he's like, "If anybody gives you any trouble to let tonight, you let me know, okay? You let me know." And I was like man and I never went to that bar as an adult because it's very sketchy yeah I had a lot of fun experiences at Giant Tiger it was wild that was really though where I started to realize that workplaces are not fair <laughs> I remember some of the the biggest things that really stuck out to me when I was working there was they had a new girl who came a couple months right before I quit and she was getting paid 12 something and I was still getting paid 1160 we had gone through so many things um, and had a lot of different instances at work that I felt like I'd proved I had a lot of responsibility. There had been like $4,000 worth of smoke stolen from the store while under this other girl's watch. Cause she, oh. had, we used to fill like a, just like a cart full of cartons of cigarettes to refill. He would go to the front, you'd write down what you need to bring. And then you'd bring a cart to the back and fill it. And she walked away from the cart while it was full of cigarettes in front of a, a whole line of customers. Who's not going to take that? That's, that's a lot of money, right? To sell. So somebody just nabbed it and they, they ran and we never saw that, that again. She'd also been caught stealing cigarettes from the store. She was getting a lot of preferential treatment and I didn't get any. So I'd gone to my manager and I'd worked there for almost a year at this point too. So I was like, I should be getting $12. Why am I not getting $12? And so I told them like, Hey, I really want to get, get paid higher. You know, I feel like I've proven myself. I've been here a long time. I know that the new hires are getting hired at 12. I want to get 12 or, or I don't, I'm going to have to look for something else. And I thought I was like really, really confident in myself. I was a little proud of myself for doing this because I, I was a little bit of an antsy person around authority. I get hyper excited when I'm in a confrontational situation where it's like, I'm partially nervous, partially amped up. And um, so I, I really have to work through high stress situations for myself. I have to really ground myself in them. And that was the first time I did this. And so she's like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a raise. We'll give you a raise. And uh, next time I got my paycheck, I look at my rate and I was getting paid eleven ninety five. <laughs> oh my goodness. I know, right? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, you know what? Mm -mm. No way. No way this is happening. No way. So I, I left. I put in my two weeks and I stuck it out for two full weeks and I, I left that job and I ended up getting a job at Future Shop. Um, and so I was doing Future Shop while I was in, in grade, I guess a great, uh, the last little part of grade 11 through grade 12. So that was a lot um, working and having school and trying to be good in school. And I don't, I, I'm, you know, how a lot of people who are kind of on the spectrum are where they do really, really great. And they're like super good reading levels and they excel in like some places and other places they completely fall off. I'm very much like that. Um, in the school, especially I was all into like English and I was all about drama class. I wanted to be an actor. That was like my dream job. And I just flubbed history, flubbed math, anything else I was just uninterested in. And because I was working and I was also writing my, my book at the same time. So I wrote a book when I was in um, high school, I got it published right after I graduated. Oh, wow. It's actually coming up 10 years almost, which is oh, wild. Goodness. That's I know cool. it's, I don't talk about it much because it's not very well written. It's very clearly written by a 17 year old girl. <laughs>
but I was writing at this time. And so I had a lot of things going on and I was pretty stressed out for, for a 17 year old. And I was also helping my parents financially at this point as well. My mom had started as a, the, the store manager of an adult store, the adult store in town um, at the time. So she, she had been there. She just left um, recently for surgery. And it, I think it's been like 13, 14 years, long time that she's there, but it didn't pay super well. Um, my dad was jumping job to job. He's a heavy duty mechanic. And yeah, he was finding it difficult to find a place in Lloyd that was not taking advantage of him. My parents are very much people who are kind of like me, I guess. They're all yes men. We love to help people and make sure that um, we can, you know, do everything that we can to better our community and people around us and very easy to take advantage of. And so my dad was experiencing that at a lot of his workplaces. Bills were tight sometimes. Um, and I started financially helping out with certain things. And if, if I wanted to do anything, you know, if I wanted to put gas in my, my car, I had to buy a car um, with all of the money I had from Giant Tiger. And I had to put gas in it and insure it. If I wanted to do that, I had to pay for it. Right. Um, so I was working a lot at Future Shop. And man, if you ever talk to anybody who's worked at a Future Shop or at a Best Buy, this is like a common denominator with everyone I've talked to. They always hate Future Shop and Best Buy unless they're actively working there. And if they actively work there, they hate it, but they're being paid decent enough to stay. <laughs> it's not a fun job. And Lloyd Minster's Future Shop particularly was really a toxic environment, especially for a teen girl. There was lots of people who were sexually intimate with each other and there wasn't a lot of discretion. You know, they'd talk about it in front of minors or include minors. Oh um, and goodness. you know, like I was in an illicit relationship with one of my adult coworkers when I was there. Wow. Yeah. And so I dated a, a co-worker of mine and he was in his like, he was like 24, I think when my, I had my 18th birthday and oh. it's like, yeah, like gross. Right. Looking back at it, I'm like, Bleh! I can't believe myself. But at the time, you know, it's an older man with money giving you attention and so he has at, his own apartment. And when you're 17, right. You think, oh yeah, it's fine. Like he's yeah. nice and everything. So you don't and see, you you don't see the it. problems inherent in it. Yeah, I, I, and it frustrated me thinking back now because there was there was so much of it and there wasn't an, any adults there who were really safe to have a conversation with where they could be like, hey, maybe you shouldn't go on, on out with this 25, 26, 27 year old kind of thing, you know? Or vice versa, I maybe also, you shouldn't like, be going out with this 17 year old. Yeah, right? Like someone have a conversation. <laughs> I also like, I just think it's, I can't, I'm 27 now. I could not even imagine. Um, sometimes when I talk to my 20 year old friends and co-organizers, I'm just like, oh, I can't wait to talk to you when your frontal lobe is developed. Like, <laughs> Once your frontal lobe is developed, you're going to be so great. But right now you got some work. Like I'm going to be 49 in a couple of months. Obviously I can't, I can't imagine dating someone who's under 18, but yeah. Even someone who's like 30 seems young to me. My partner now, if we actually met shortly after my 18th birthday, which is, I, we have a, quite a bit of an age difference, but I think the difference there is like, um, he's pretty weirded out by it. And we've been in a, we were on and off through a lot of my early adulthood and have kind of settled back into each other now. You know, we, we have growth there. He never met me as a minor. Um, <laughs> we also, yeah, there's, I'll tell you that whole thing about my, my partner and I in a bit. But yeah, I worked, I worked at Future Shop, terrible time. Um, and then I ended up, uh, when I graduated and I turned 18, my mom was like, hey, we need somebody to come work in the adult store. And you're 18 now, you want to come work? <laughs> and I was like, mm, all right. $15 an hour? Hell yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's one thing um, to work in an adult store as an 18 year old. It's another thing to work in an adult store as an 18 year old that your mom owns. I know, right? <laughs> oh, it was amazing too. Cause like people are so rude in the adult store. Cause obviously you can't return no anything, doubt. right? But people will try. And I, I remember one guy when I was working there, I, I quit future shop and I went there full time to help my mom out. I always did evening shifts. So I work 4 p.m. to 10. And when I first started off doing kind of like full time there, man, people take notice that there's a young person there because it's oh. usually older ladies, right? People are so horrible. They try and yell at you if you, if you, you don't, you know, give in immediately. And I remember this one guy, he brought, oh, it was so bad. He brought in an egg vibrator that he had got with his wife and he explains to me that he turned it on for 20 minutes and left it running on the table and it died and now it won't turn back on 
one, but they changed the batteries, won't turn back on. So he wants to return it and get another one. And I'm like, sir, you want, you want <laughs> me to believe that you turned this intimate toy on, put it down on the table for 20 minutes, watched it vibrate for 20 minutes until Heard it stopped it vibrating moving. on the table. Yeah, like you just saw, you watched it for 20 minutes vibrating on the table until it turned off and then checked to see if it would work anymore, realized it wouldn't. Then, and then that's when you got mad because your intimate experience is no longer going to have this vibrator in it, right? Wow. And he's screaming at me. And he's like, I'm going to call your manager and I'm going to tell her how you're acting with me. I was like, go ahead, buddy. The worst you can do is ground me because <laughs> I'm just tired of this guy at this point. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, call her. She's my mom. She'll probably side with me. He walked out, he left this vibrator there and I had to throw it in the garbage because it was gross. Yeah, um, and I was just like, there's so many times where people were acting super strange. And then I'm like, yeah, uh, my mom is the manager. So keep that in mind. She watches the security tapes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was great though. Um, there's some people are really weird. Uh, a lot of men assume that you're like some sort of way. Sure. Which like, doesn't matter if you are, it's none of your business when I'm at work. Like I'm just trying to, trying to do labor, my guy. Right. I'm just selling my labor for capital. <laughs> Leave me alone. To my mom. Yeah. I'm selling my labor to my mom for capital, dude. So this is the weirdest chore I've ever had for my allowance. Like just let me live. <laughs> but yeah, I worked there and then I ended up, um, because cost of living and I wanted to, I wanted to move out. I started working at Starbucks in the mornings for a little while. And so I would work 5.30 at Starbucks AM and I would work till 2 PM. And then I would work four to 10 at the adult store. And I did that for, I think three and a half weeks before I was like, you know what? $12 and 35 cents an hour is not, not worth this. And it, it was like, I started, my first day was pumpkin spice lattes first day. <laughs> so I learned immediately that Starbucks is hell and that nobody cares about your feelings unless they get their pumpkin spice. <laughs> and I was just like, this is terrible. I can't do this. And I was so tired. And then I ended up quitting there. I don't know why. I think it was just because I'm so overtired, but I wrote them a, a my quitting note in calligraphy, which I was practicing at the time. <laughs> like really weird. I was there for three weeks work super hard and they show up one day with this like beautifully written script on like this beautiful handmade paper and I just threw it at them I was like sorry bye That's awesome yeah after that I went to um David's Tea my friend was the store manager and I started working there for her and I actually got this was like the first time I got a fun important position at work because they had me as their assistant manager within three months of working there and that was a lot. That actually was a terrible job in a lot of ways, mostly just because working with friends and working in an all female group where everybody is between the ages of like 25 was the oldest and the youngest was 15. And some of them went to school together and some of them were like friends. Um, and so we were basically like managing this like uh, group of young women who were very catty with each other, had costumes personalities um, and then me and my manager had different management styles um, and so there was lots of struggle but we we made it work we actually had one of the best stores in in Alberta our store is consistently one of the highest performing we had um, better numbers than West Edmonton Mall oh, like wow. not in terms of like the dollar amounts that we were making, there were some days where we definitely did exceed their dollar amount, but the ratio of like how much people were spending compared to how many customers we had, um, oh, we were okay. consistently actually one of the top three in the, in the um, entire country, which nice. we were so proud of that. We were absolutely simps for our job. It was like a cult culture in David's Tea. Like, you know how uh, MLMs and like health wellness places have that really high energy oh, yeah, yeah. cult vibe to them that they try and really pull you in? David's Tea really tried to channel that. We were really encouraged to just like pump and rep the brand up. Like David's Tea could do no wrong kind of thing. Our company had like internal memes, like there was a culture, but it was toxic when you were in management. I, I had heard a story about a manager who was on the phone with one of the D like the district manager who was really, really strict. You could not leave or interrupt her when she's talking to you. You can't for nothing. She would freak out. She had this store manager on the, the phone for like two hours. And the store manager couldn't even say it was too scared to tell her that they had to go to the bathroom and ended up <laughs> peeing themselves in the back room because oh this manager, this district manager would lose their shit. 
right? Wow. Like there was a, a real culture of fear that was perpetrated in, in a lot of spaces. And yeah, it was really, it was interesting. Um, my last couple of weeks there, I ended up going to my next worst job in the universe. I, I started doing support work as a part-time. And then I, as I decided to leave David's teeth permanently, I actually had like a lot of horrible experiences with my coworkers, which was really frustrating because we had built some really strong friendship connections over our years working together. But because of the culture of the workplace, it just became so bad. Um, I got left alone with like 12 customers in the store for three hours and one of the assistant managers because when I had stepped down they hired two people into the role um because they were trying to expand the store which didn't work out because it closed now so haha um <laughs> at, haha David's tea I won they got rid of you that's why yeah exactly I've, I've been blaming it on them since but yeah they they had had two assistant managers one of them walked in looked at me as I'm sitting there with like 12 people in the store and just walked out one of the high schoolers who had been a seasonal came from his school to come on his lunch break, saw that I was busy and unpaid just came behind and like made drinks for people and helped them. And I was like, wow. you don't have to do this. Like you don't work here anymore. And like, but that was just, there was nobody there. And so that was actually my last day I quit. And I went full time doing support care for a group called Gates Consulting, which is basically ABA, but really poorly managed and poorly trained. My job, essentially, I would go pick up kids either from school or from their house. I'll give you a full example of, my, of how a day would go. So I'm, I start off the day in Lloyd. I would pick up a kid in Elk Point, Alberta, which is like, I'd say about 45 minutes, 50 minutes drive from here. Um, and then I would drive that kid to St. Paul, pick up another kid in St. Paul, drive those two kids to Bonneville, pick up another kid in Bonneville. And then it would be time for the kid who I picked up in Elk Point to go home. So I'd have to drive back to Elk Point, drop the kid off in Elk Point, and then it would be time for the kid in St. Paul to go home because we've been driving. So I've yeah. done nothing with these kids, right? Except wow. drive around. Wow. Um, and that, that was essentially my job. Um, there were some days where we would be inside of one of the schools in Bonneville doing some work, depending on what kids you had. It was really all over the place. I had incidences where I had kids who were very volatile and I wasn't trained to deal with those situations properly. My boss told me to sit on kids when they were giving me any kind of grief. Um, and I'd watched her once. Yeah, sit on them. Um, these are kids with developmental disabilities. Oh my um, and they have behavioral issues or they have, we're working with kids who had trauma, kids who had oppositional defiance disorder. We had kids who, who were on the autism spectrum. We had kids with, who were physically disabled. And she would tell me to sit on them. One time there was this cute little kid. He just, he was like one of my favorite, six years old. He had some physical deformities and like, they were super minor, but it just kind of, he was very small because of these like different parts of his development. Really tiny guy, so sweet. He couldn't really talk. It was a lot of echolalia with him, but you, you know, you can communicate with him and he had his way of communication. He just had to sit and listen to him and, and take the time to understand it. And he had a minor behavior with her. I can't even remember what it was about. I think it was something about trains and she just pinned him on the ground and sat on him oh and he's goodness. crying and screaming. And she's, I'm not getting up until you've calmed down. And it's like, how, how are you going to get him to calm down? You're sitting on a six-year-old child. He's freaking out because you're sitting on him. Exactly. And, and like, this was just the, the things that we were told to do, right? Like I had a kid who lived with me from this program. They wanted me to basically become a foster parent to a teenager How old who tried you? to kill. Uh, I was 21, 22. She was oh. 17, actually oh, 16, 17. Goodness. She tried to kill me twice. The reason she, they moved her from the place that she was before was because she had tried to physically harm a toddler. And so they're like, yeah, we're going to move her to your house where you have pets and animals and it's just you. Oh um, and they wanted me to get a house so that I could do respite. And I got like the owner of the company wrote down a guarantee for me that I'd be getting four grand a month for taking on these respite things. And I found a house that was $2,100 a month to rent. And he was all like, yep, you should totally do that. I'll make sure that you have enough money. Well, here I come working for him full time. My check comes in once a month. It's $2,100 every time. And it was just like, I ended up going into a huge amount of credit card debt through yeah. this job. Um, I had to pay for my own gas and I was working what? up in Westlock. Yeah. They made me pay for my own gas. All they that driving. Me, yeah. And they, oh they, told, me, um, they told me that uh, I would get it back on taxes. 
um, and that they, I would get like a huge tax return. I like, I think that the lady who, who told me that is straight up like lying to the government about her tax info. Cause she's telling me she was getting like 10 K returns and I paid like well over $10,000 in gasoline. And I put a hundred thousand plus kilometers on my brand new vehicle that I had just bought like two years before, not even. I got $10,000 tax return. Yeah. And I got nothing. Oh I got, goodness. I think I got a $2,000 return max. And yeah. I, I like, I have no dependents. I had no other income and I did not make a lot of money. It was basically a scam. Like they were using everything that I had and emotionally manipulating me with these kids. Like I remember one day there was a blizzard um, up in Bonneville and that I had to work in Bonneville that day. There was like a horrible, horrible road conditions. They said, don't go out, don't drive. So I called my boss and I was like, Hey, I saw the road conditions and I'm, I'm not going to go out to Bonneville today. I'm just going to take, take the day to do documents. Right. Like I yelled at, you can't do that. This parent is relying on you to go there. You need to go there. So she yelled at me until I, I, I was crying and I finally gave in. I was like, okay, I'll go. So I start driving there. I get into a car accident on Murphy road, which is, um, up north and I have to call a tow truck and everything like I can't get my vehicle out and 20 minutes after the tow truck shows up I'm back on the road on my way to Bonneville the parent cancels on me says oh hey it's too, it's not safe enough for you to drive up today don't don't bother coming oh my goodness that's ridiculous yeah. so yeah that was a that was an experience and it was really horrible because like a good friend of mine ended up working for them for a bit. And my partner ended up working for them for a bit. Like we're all still financially recovering from the job. And I only worked there for a year. I worked there from um, 2017 to 2018. Finally, I got fed up with it. And I ended up getting a job at Warehouse One as a store manager. And I was just like, bye. <laughs> Same day, bye. Good gone. My partner, Kevin, he had gone from the oil fields to start working for them doing respite pretty much full time. And then he ended up wanting to just get out of oil field because it's terrible. And so he was working for them. And when I quit, they just stopped giving him shifts. They never fired him. They didn't like lay him off or anything like that. So I think they still owe him severance. IMO, but I don't think he'd ever get it if he tried. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And then I worked short term at warehouse one as a store manager didn't like it terrible time um i ended up actually getting fired from that job which oh. yeah they just said they weren't going in the direction they wanted i, I think it's just because <laughs> they wanted to hire the assistant manager as the store manager and when they had originally went to hire she said she wasn't ready but she decided like a month into me being there that she was ready to be the store manager so then yeah, it's just ridiculous. I never understand you, that yeah. thing when it's like, oh, we're going in a different direction. It's like, what? You're part of a chain. What do you mean you're going in a different direction? Yeah. That happened to my, uh, our oldest partner was working at uh, a local fast food joint and they started talking to their coworkers about organizing. And then all of a sudden they got a meeting with one of their managers and said, yeah, we're going in a different direction. It's like, you're a franchisee. What do you mean you're going in a different direction? Right? Like oh my you are the same store as bootlegger. Like they're doing <laughs> the same thing as you. But yeah, I, I ended up getting fired. And then the assistant manager moved into that position. And then I started another horrible job because I can't stop finding the worst ones. And I started working at Cosmoprof, which is a beauty supply store. I'm not a super huge girly girl. I used to wear makeup when I was in high school. And then I decided one day that I should just get used to having the face that I have because it's the only one that I have. I used to make myself look like I had a black eye all the time when I tried being emo didn't really work out so <laughs> I'm not a girly girl I don't really do anything super spectacular like I take pride in my my appearance but I'm not going to put any extra effort in it unless I'm getting a tattoo then I'm going to put all the effort I want right <laughs> save um, up all your makeup so, money for tattoos exactly right it's permanent I don't have to do anything with it it's just it brings me joy um but I started working here and it's a beauty supply store so they're really expecting you to kind of go up and like business casual and stuff so I was putting a little bit more effort but my boss, the boss for this store, oh my gosh, she had a reputation in the community for being a terrible boss and having no staff retention. I knew that going in, but I was also really desperate for a job and minimum wage hadn't been in like put into Alberta yet where it was 15 an hour. And this was the only place that I could find that was hiring for decent. She hired me at 14 um, and this was in September. So right before minimum wage. And I assumed because it's Lloydminster, everybody was going to go up to 15. Boy, was I wrong. 
Um, <laughs> fun fact about Lloyd, we take the sides very seriously. You can get hired for $11 here. Wow. It's terrible. Even on the Alberta um, side? On the Saskatchewan side only. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's why if you have a business in the Saskatchewan side, like good luck hiring anybody because all of us look, we'll look at it and we're like, no. Not even. It's not happening. I would get a job um, on the other side. Yeah, why not? You can you can go work at McDonald's and get paid higher on um, Alberta side. McDonald's, right? So I worked there, and the boss was something. So I'll, I'll tell you some of the rules that we had. Number one, us coworkers were not allowed to talk to each other while we worked. What? Yeah, she gave us a really fake reason of being like, we only want to encourage talk about the store and about this, like you're on my time, you're on the store's time kind of thing. It's just because we were friends and she didn't like that we didn't like her and we didn't include her in stuff. Um, <laughs> was she like 31 yeah. or something? She totally was. <laughs> like, And like the rest of us were all like 20. There was only yeah. one other girl who was, who was a little bit older, um, but she, we loved her because she was in our vibe. We'd like invite her out for supper and stuff all the time. She had the worst experience um there too because our boss was super racist towards her she's she's the only person who was like visibly um, marginalized she's indigenous and this boss said to her once this employee broke her foot at work by the way didn't get any reports boss didn't want to do any reports for this and so she needed a break because she was walking around in a cast and her boss was like no one's gonna hire you you're just a dirty native oh. like just full-on mascots like this oh this is how this boss is terrible right and also th this other this worker was the only person in the store who got paid 11 dollars. everyone else got a higher wage and we were no so mad we, when we tried to find out for that we tried to fight for get a higher wage we had called the called the line and everything. We'd had conversations with HR. HR freaking told her these like the boss these conversations, and she found out who submitted what and had one on one conversations where she yelled at us about what we had said. It was so bad. Like they totally broke our confidence in them. Pretty much everybody who I worked with has left that job since. Um, That's but totally I remember why we need unions. Yeah, right. Like it was, oh it was goodness. horrible. Like the way we were treated was so bad. I'll have to send these to you. I found them the other day in my Google Drive, but I took pictures of all of the signs that she had up in our our back room, and it was <laughs> things like "Your job is on the line," like "You are replaceable," all of this horrible shit that she would say to us. Um, and and she used to tell me I would come to work with like my hair up in a ponytail, wearing like a white dress shirt, and I would be like in a skirt and all of this. She would come up to me and be like, "A ponytail is not professional." professional like you don't look good you don't look nice you need to try and make yourself look more attractive you need to wear makeup when you show up here and I finally said to her one day I was like seriously are you so insecure that you need to tell me to change my appearance never said anything to me after that wow nothing I got a job at Aaron's furniture you sell and lease furniture which is the next bad job yeah um, I, I started working there and I, the, the day I got a call that I got a new job and I was getting hired at $16 an hour. I walked into Cosmo Prof. I was supposed to start my shift. I came in in like baggy sweatpants and like a super <laughs> sloppy shirt. My hair was really messy. And I just tossed my keys at her. And I was like, bye, bitch. <laughs> Never yeah. went back. I don't blame Can't you. Can't go back in because I don't have a membership. But I was just so over her and she was, yeah, she was yeah. so mean to us. She was racist and she was insensitive to customers. She would follow around customers like a hawk. Like she was very horrible to be around. And she actually ended up leaving that job and going to another place um, where everybody got to see her be toxic publicly because she was working in the mall and she ended up getting fired from there because she had so many customers complain about her because in Cosmoprof, it was only people who have licenses who can go in. Right. So you don't get to, you don't get to view it the same way, but you can't act like that in public. Right. So she yeah. had a rude awakening. Um, and I was working then at Aaron selling furniture and leasing furniture, which is a scam. I'll, I don't care. <laughs> you can come at me for that. No, it's I a scam. They wanted a PlayStation 4 and like an Xbox. They wanted you to buy it for $1,500. What? Yeah, because you could well, you over, lease it. You spread it over a few years or whatever. Oh my God. Yeah. But even if you wanted to buy it outright from them, they expected like twice as much as the retail price. That's wrong. And like, TVs are like three grand, four grand. And oh. it's just like, it's so gross how, and it, honestly, the worst thing I think for me was because it's Lloyd Minster and we're a social hub for all of these other communities. A lot of the people who were coming in to buy were people who were out of town and who were already, you know, poor and didn't have 
a lot of means. And on top of that, it was a lot of indigenous people. So lots of people coming in from the reserve and we were re repossessing things from the reserve and we were calling people on the reserve, harassing them for payments. And that was really hard for me. I, I'm not from this, this area. I'm not from Onion Lake Nation, but I have friends in Onion Lake. I have friends in Frog Lake and Saddle Lake. We're going all the way out to Saddle Lake and Kahiwa and it's like three hours away. It's just because that they could exploit natives, right? And, and that was our, our boss would talk about that. Native people are going to buy, buy, buy. It doesn't matter if we don't get all their payments because we'll get the furniture back anyway. But we will buy, buy, buy. We had the highest amount in all of like Western Canada at the, the store here. Like that was the culture. It was really like just not fun. I didn't like it very much. Um, oh, no. I started a second part-time job doing uh, cannabis sales right after legalization had been for around for like a year I think there was a new store opening up that was really bougie like it was supposed to be a lab experience so like we were <laughs> there was like a speakeasy I had like a washing machines for the front and we all had to wear like full black and we were supposed to be called product guides and stuff like it was basically like an apple store yeah it was very very corny you're gonna have to work um, with the was, guests yeah well we had um we had a, a cannabis I actually made it. I donated so much of my extra labor. I made like gigantic information pages about all of the different strains and terpenes and all of this shit. Like it, it was like a boutique for cannabis. It was supposed to be artistic. Our cheapest bong was $300. Like oh my. it was so bougie. And yeah, I, I was working there part-time and I ended up in the summer deciding I wanted to go do one full month of volunteer work for this Christian camp. Young, I used to do Young Life for years and years. I was a coordinator. Generally, I was all doing that on the background of all of this, coordinating and going to camp once a week in the summer. But I wanted to do summer staff, which is their volunteer thing. I decided to lie to both of my jobs and say that I had to go to BC for an emergency and that I wasn't sure when I'd be back, but I'd come back at some point. And you didn't for either of them? No, I didn't. Well, you know, it was super wild because so I, I was there for almost the full month. And from errands, I got a text that I was getting fired. And I was like, <laughs> over text. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, sorry to hear that. It was nice working for you. And then they sent me $500 severance, which was great because I had wow. I'd worked for a month. I was like, oh, hell yeah. I love that. I love getting money. And then the other job actually continued to wait. And so when I got back and I told them I was back, they're just like, okay, great. Here's when you're, you're starting your shift again. Oh. So I, yeah, I just kind of transitioned back into working full time, even though I totally ditched them for an entire month and just fucked off to go do volunteer work and scrub toilets. Yeah, I was pretty fun. I honestly didn't think I'd get it back, uh, but I went, went and did that. And then I worked at a hotel for the last little bit of the fall of 2019. And that's when I really started getting into the political space because I would work from like seven o'clock to like three at the hotel. And I'm just going room to room with the TV on and I'm watching like C-SPAN and I'm watching uh, CNN. Yeah. Um, and I was watching at the time Bernie and I was watching Jagmeet and really yeah. really kind of honing in on those campaigns and and seeing what was going on right and cleaning hotel toilets and endlessly finding alcohol to take home because they would let you do that if you found beer really? in someone's hotel room yeah if they checked out and they were gone you could take it oh wow um, yeah there was one housekeeper i we were working together on the same floor early on she found a palm bay and just cracked it she's like i'm not driving home today and just <laughs> started drinking while we were working drinking uh, she also while you're watching it. bernie yeah, she also dropped a toy uh, somebody's toothbrush in the toilet though. So like, I feel like it's not a good idea to do that. I wouldn't recommend it if you're a housekeeper. Yikes! <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, I, I was working there and I was doing that, which another long, long time, uh, lots of work for me because I would go hotel weed store, hotel weed store, and then I would put, fill in for my mom, which I still do periodically at the adult store. Um, I'll go work some shifts. My brother actually works there now. It's family business, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh awesome. yeah so I'll, I'll fill in his shifts if he needs a day off or whatever so I was doing lots of work at that time and it's tiring especially because I felt like I wasn't really getting anywhere so I was like okay I can't do this hotel job anymore it's too much so I, I quit I think just shortly after the election actually or maybe on, in early in November and then I ended up deciding to go to BC again for some friend time hanging out and when I came back 
I moved into a new place that had, I had kind of disrupted my life because I was a little depressed and, you know, sometimes you got to shake it up by dismantling all of your, your stability, including getting a new job, which I ended up working at PetSmart for a little while. Terrible job. Also, I think it's just, you know, retail is a bad, bad space for me. And I, as much as I've enjoyed customers and aspects of retail, I think retail as a whole, I'm not compatible when I'm a manager, I'm too nice. And when I'm an employee, I'm too <laughs> like, I need to be in a union is essentially what it is. I couldn't yeah. be in retail unless there was a union. Yeah. And yeah, and so I ended up working at PetSmart for a bit. Really didn't love it. I just kind of no-showed on them. I'm proud to say that. I'm a proud no-shower. <laughs> I, did that I know it's taboo. Yeah, you know, I know it's taboo, but I think that we should reclaim no showing. I think if a job has not given you enough reason to respect them, that's not on you as a worker. That's on the job for being shitty. Yeah. I'm reclaiming it. Yeah. Reclaim being a being a walkout worker. Fuck that. <laughs> um, right? So I ended up I did that for R slash I anti work. Yeah, and it R slash anti work. Let's walk out work movement right now. Walk out workers rise up. And then, yeah, I, I worked at the cannabis store for a bit. And then I ended up wanting to leave there again, just because man, that was a shit show. We needed a union. Um, <laughs> we needed a union. So freaking bad. Okay. So we had a manager. First of all, our first manager who, who had originally got hired the store got fired. We don't know why found out it was because she had sent like 300 emails to the coordinator, but it's because he just didn't answer any of her emails over months and months. He made it seem like this was like 300 in a week. It was 300 over like the course of months yeah. of him not doing his job. And he was like, she's annoying. Let's fire her. And because I personally think that the store which no longer exists. It's been since sold. Uh, I think it was a money laundering front because all of the people who owned it were a bunch of super wealthy lawyers who lived in Ottawa and had literally never stepped foot in Lloydminster. What? Why Lloydminster of all places then? Right? Why Lloydminster? Why make it a speakeasy with laundry machines at the front? And why say that we made a million dollars in profit when we definitely didn't? It was a laundering front. So that's just a, allegedly a theory. But yeah, so they hired a, this new manager who was horrible. She was a co-worker at first, but then when she moved up into her new position, she would lose it on us. She would bring her cat to work for some reason. I mean, like, were we ever upset that the cat was there? No, but the principal is weird because she would just let him pee in the back room, right? Like super weird. Um, she assaulted a customer. It was on camera. Um, she assaulted verbally all of us multiple times to start rumors and stuff just all over the place. And we ended up having a, a conversation with her in the back room with this coordinator on the phone, trying to explain what the problems were in store. And I was speaking and he kept trying to talk over me. He's a bit of a misogynist. And I was like, no, 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 I am reclaiming my time. I am speaking right now. You are listening to me. You're going to respect what I'm saying. So he shut up. We ended up having this big fight in the back room with her and she was like screaming at us. And then she ended up getting fired after this incident he ended up getting fired after this incident because it also turned out they were having a thing <laughs> shocker no wonder she got away with all this behavior right oh, um goodness. and then so they brought in new people another person got hired up into management and it was good for a while when covid came around we didn't have any cleaning supplies we didn't have any protections and i got sick right at the beginning of covid when it got to a pandemic. I didn't actually have COVID. I just had a cold. Bad timing on my part. And so I was gone for the two-week quarantine period where I got served and everything. I come back and when I had left, there was like no cleaning supplies, nothing, no masks, nothing, right? I came back and it was the exact same. No cleaning supplies what? had been ordered. Nobody had cleaned the bathroom in two weeks, which is disgusting. Oh my goodness. It was the, the moment I realized I was the only person who did it. And I was like, oh, that's not good. This, I love cleaning toilets. It's my little quirk. I clean like 200 in one summer. So, you know, it's like, this can do it super fast. So I do it, but people, nobody did it for two weeks. When we talked to them on the phone, they told us straight up that they just weren't intending on getting anything for us. We had talked to them about different things like, oh, we might need to have a sick leave, or could you increase our wages right now while COVID is here? And all of these different things. Nope, 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 nope. Totally fought us on it. Finally got to the point where it was just like, obvious they didn't give a shit that we were kind of on our own. And I was at this point looking for a new job and was tentatively looking at getting hired for the job that I just left. Okay, so we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation where the HR manager basically told me the store wouldn't have any problems if I didn't work there because I kept telling everybody in the store that they have rights. 
<laughs> and that we should be getting paid more. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And then <laughs> about 45 minutes after that, I got an email from one of the, the other people on HR saying that I was fired <laughs> and that I, I, this was my, I was in lieu of a severance. I would have to work two weeks and <laughs> all of my managers were there. My two managers were there and I was like, yo, you guys, I just fucking got fired. And they're like, what? No, you didn't. We have you. You're the only person scheduled in for next month for, for all of these vacation days. So they just, they fired me without talking to any of the managers or anything oh like goodness. that. It's total bull crap. Right. And so it was just like, whatever. I ended up, I worked my last two weeks. Um, and then I, we ended up having like a games night in the store and I was just like, I'm going to miss this place, but I absolutely will not miss any of the bullshit that we sure. had to put up with. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was wild. I definitely, yeah, would not, would not ever want to work in a, that kind of space again. Retail needs unions. We really needs unions though. Um, the cannabis industry is honestly a shit show. Um, I've heard things not only from people in like the, the retail level, but in production level, all of the, the different pieces of cannabis, there's, there's, they need unions. There, there should definitely be a cannabis unionization push. Honestly, um, and it wouldn't then, yeah, surprise my... me if the production level is using temporary foreign workers. Agriculture is a big area that hires temporary foreign workers. It's bad. But yeah, then my next job, which is the last and latest, I worked as a support care worker for two years. It's the best job I've ever had. I'm going to cry if I think about it. It was really great. I was just doing one-on-one -on -one support for a really fantastic man with disabilities. I mean, like the, the kind of ups and downs of support work, like you're spending every day with somebody and it, it does get really difficult um, as it yeah. does spending time with somebody one-on-one -on -one all the time. Right. Um, but he was great. He has a lot of personality. I did, I went to school with him. He was in college. So I do his college courses. I did work with him. He had two different jobs during my time there. We would clean the gym together on his college campus. And then we did landscaping for a little bit, uh, which was really fun. And he was a big bike, he had a tandem bike. So we would go on bike oh, rides nice. all the time and That's we awesome. did biking club together. And yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, there were some issues too. Uh, during the election, there was some questioning on whether or not I'd be able to stay employed with my job just due to my association with politics, um, which was really disheartening. And there was also some incidences with coworkers that were less than ideal. Like one of my, one of my coworkers left for maternity and they were trying to hire some people for this other position. And they ended up hiring one lady who like just did not give a crap about COVID in any way, shape or form. Um, and we had like a big gala thing where it was like a fundraiser. There was like 300 people there unmasked. And it was really the first time I had ever gone to something since COVID started. I wasn't really prepared for what was happening. I didn't really know what was what it was going to be like. And I thought I'd be okay. I went in with my mask, but there was people like coughing into their hands and shaking hands with each other and ignoring the hand sanitizer. And like, that's just gross. And I just ended up kind of panicking about it. And this woman comes out to talk to me as my supervisor. And she's like, oh, you know, like, it's really not that bad. It's almost over. It's not as bad as people are saying. If my sister's a nurse and she says it's just like the flu, it's just like the cold. And I was like, well, you know, the flu doesn't kill a million people in a year. The flu doesn't kill seven people a day. You know, like um, this was at, at the point where I think um, that six, 69 people had died in a week right around that time, you know, I said to her, I was like, come on, like, I can Google this right now and, and prove it wrong. And she says, well, it's only going to hurt old people and immunocompromised people. And I was and? like, so you mean the literal people who are in that building that we are fundraising for? Yeah. I was like, why don't we just go shoot some old people and some disabled people then if we, if we don't care about their lives like that? She's like, Oh, you, that's not what I mean. I was like, well, what do you mean then? You know, what are you, what are you meaning? And this same lady had said to me two times when she was telling a story, she had dropped the R slur. And also the second time she had dropped the R slur, you know, while we're working, talking about how to help people with developmental disabilities. She says, oh, you know, I don't say this that often. I was like, well, 
You just said it twice, so. You say it once and then you follow up with, I don't say this that often. And I know for a fact, you've already said it once before. I'm gonna assume you're lying, right? Like that was something where there was a little bit of tension, but that was more with the, the actual organization. I, cause my hiring was a little bit different than a lot of people who worked for them. I worked for the family privately first, and then I was hired into the, the organization afterwards to fulfill what they would have had a different person doing. So I was really doing the job of two people, which was a lot. And it, like, I have a lot of mental health issues and like 2020 sucked for everybody. Um, it sucked for me. I lost a friend. I lost my grandpa, you know, there's lots of stuff. And so I was having some, some mental health struggles and COVID is, has been a big thing. Like really anxious about COVID with my job, my mental health struggles and my, I guess my desire not to have COVID over and over again was just in the way of me being a good support care worker. Another thing is I noticed when they posted the new job, my old job that they put the wage at like $4 less. So really, oh yeah. Um, oh, wow. which I, I honestly, I, it's sad. I just feel frustrated for for the person I supported, because when I couldn't support myself on the wage I was getting, I was getting paid pretty good. Um, just the cost of living is so terrible. And like we had debt that we we're paying off. And um, my partner stopped working for a while because he wanted to get out of oil fields and it was breaking his body. Just frankly, um, it's, it's a terrible industry to work for and they don't care about you and they will disable you and then throw you aside. And that's where he was getting. So um, we'd been going through a lot of different stuff and yeah, just had a, had a hard time. Ended up losing that job, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. And here you are. And here I am. And now I'm just uh, currently doing some studying on Métis Nation politics um, with the Reach for the Sky program with the Femme Mitchif Opetissimoak, which is through the Métis Nation of Alberta. And yeah, it's actually been really great. I just spend all my time drinking coffee, trying to feed this murder outside of my house and teach them to unionize the people around me. Yeah, I get to spend some quality time reflecting on um, where my people come from and where where my ancestors, where they wanted things to go in the future and how I can, can continue to honor that legacy. Cool. Yeah. So you already touched on this a little bit, but this is a question I ask all of my guests is how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? Are there other experiences that you could think of that you wanted to share? You kind of already touched on this, I think. I think the biggest thing that I have noted through my time, especially as a, as a woman worker and working in traditionally female jobs, is that like your value is so low to people. People look down on, on the jobs that I work. I think that has been a big one. I don't really face a lot of racism just because I'm a very white passing person, but I do get from people like my boss at Cosmo Pro, for example, um, I get people who feel quite comfortable expressing their racism to me because they are under the assumption that I'm going to be sympathetic to them or that I'm just going to not say anything because they're so used to people being in that position where if, if they say something inappropriate, you either get like a half chuckle or you get people being like, ha ha, yeah, right? So because of my, you know, my white passingness, people feel very comfortable um, expressing that to me. Being in... Floyd Minster too, actually, one thing people don't really talk about, but the class marginalization in Lloyd is really, really, really big. There is a sense of entitlement, especially people who have um, spouses who make quite a bit of money in the oil field or previously did. This entitlement, this sense of like, like people deserve better, they deserve certain treatment or what have you. Um, and so that's something that I noticed a lot. People treat people in the service industry really, really poorly. I remember one time when we first went through kind of a, a, a recession and I want to say 2015 is when I, when this would have happened, 2016, we had a lady who had come in actually applying for a job at David's Tea when I was working there. And she explained to us that her husband had been in oil fields and he had just lost his job. And so she was looking for something now and we're like, okay, cool. Yeah. You like, you can fill out your resume and you know, we'll put it in our pile. We're going to be doing resume calls out next week. And she goes, I don't think that you understood what I just said. Oh my goodness. My husband used to work for Husky and he just lost his job. And so now I have to get a job so I can support some things in my life. So I need a job. And we're like, okay, well, with that attitude, don't expect a call back. 
but you can still <laughs> give us your resume if you want. Like, do you just want us to magically hand you all of the, the starting paper? Like, like it really felt that that entitlement of like, like these people who have, you know, they have silver spoons in their mouth or people who I, who expect to have really high level jobs and who don't have the means to get them because they just just straight up, honestly, don't exist anymore. Um, and they haven't existed for a long time. And I don't think they're going to exist um, unless we really fight for, for good jobs. But, you know, like there, there's that sense of, of class entitlement. I find it, it's very pervasive. A lot of ways, it's very subtle too. Even now, I notice today, you can tell who's, who's in working class and who doesn't really work as much because people who are working constantly tend to be the ones who are masked up. Especially in Lloyd, I find like interacting socially with people, you can almost kind of tell who, <laughs> if they live on like the poor side of town or if they live out in like college park where it's all expensive, expensive houses, just because there's a different demeanor. It's a class divide in, in a very subtle, but very pervasive way. Mm, that's interesting. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our listeners? Um, yeah. Um, my final thoughts are we all deserve better. We all have shitty workplace stories and we can all, laugh and you know talk about the things that um, our workplaces have been but we all know at the end of the day that we do deserve better and that we all have to be fighting for that so that you know one day there's going to be people who don't have to tell these shitty work stories we want to be able to live in a future where things are better and I think that we're in a very unique place where we can have these conversations um, recognize that there are problems and then in solidarity work together for them. So I just encourage your listeners, organize in your communities, get off your butts. You know, I have to reconcile with myself. Sometimes I want to be lazy. I want to be a Twitter typer, but sometimes you just have to get up, do some work so that we can all have better work. And uh, it's our responsibility to do what we can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been great. I've really enjoyed all these great stories that you've had to share. <laughs> I hope our listeners have enjoyed them just as much. Uh, where can people follow you and your work if they're interested in, you know, learning more socials or if you have a blog or podcast or whatever? Yeah, um, right now I only really have my Twitter. It's at D-E-E-B-I-Z-Z-O. I do have like a Instagram and a Facebook, but I'm kind of in the process of retiring them because... It's meta. It's Zuckerberg. <laughs> I'm just not. Um, also, they changed the Instagram algorithm. I, I can't be on that place anymore. It's so ugly. I only really use Twitter right now. Um, I am working on some stuff now that I'm at home all the time. So you might see some things, but if I have anything going on, it'll most likely be posted on my Twitter account. Cool. <laughs> We'll be sure to include that in the in the episode description. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter. We have a daily, weekly, and monthly newsletter where you can stay up to date on the news articles that we write every day. If you like this episode and the podcast in general, please rate and review the podcast. And you can support the Alberta Worker by going to albertaworker.ca slash support. If you're interested in being a guest on the Alberta Worker, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca. Thank you once again to Des for joining us today. Thank you to all the listeners for joining in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity. Solidarity.